the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thanks for being here. Um, weather and all that. I'm from New England. This weather is just what I love. <laughs> Cold and wet. But um, my name is Nat White. Uh, I came to Flagstaff in 1969 uh, as a student at Newell Observatory. And a year or two later, they decided I should stay. So I stayed there the rest of my career. So from graduate school to my career and one jump. Uh, I've been retired since 2008, I think. Oh, good timing. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This was when the depression hit. Yeah. Well, that's, it happened because I retired. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, so so uh, that's who I am. Uh, I'm on the board of the community college and I'd like to introduce Dr. Colin Smith, who's the president of the community college. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to really behave myself. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's my boss. I have my boss. <laughs> so, uh, I had this comment a number of times in the last week or so. I hear you're going to talk about comments <laughs> because it's a comment talk. CCC comments, <laughs> you know. And, 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 um, but anyways, I'm not talking about comets. I'm talking about distances, astronomical distances, and how we know what they are. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the details. I'm going to try to talk in a way that the whole thing makes sense to you, even if you don't understand the details. So it's that type of a talk that I'm, uh, I'm going to try to uh, do. And you can tell me afterwards whether I did it or not. This is, this is so amazing. Yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> Every it's time like I look at it. All the places in all the world. Yeah. Right? <laughs> in this one little small room. <laughs> Anyways, distance is obviously a fundamental in astronomy. And I'll emphasize that a little bit later. But they're also important in everyday life. So you're going across the road, and you look and about a quarter of a mile down the road. There's a car coming, let's say, across the road. Getting the other side, now you want to go back again. That car is maybe only 50 yards away. Well, I don't think I'm going to go across the road. You had to know what the distance was. Do you know how you knew what the distance is? And I'll use this word over and over again. It was parallax. You have two sets of eyes, and they're separated. One eye is seeing that car in the background. The other side is seeing that car, but the different background because the eye is looking that way and looking that way. And your brain automatically understands that angle, computes, and gives you an idea of what the distance is. So we're, we're doing that all the time. Uh, and so, Think if you lived through life and you knew everything was two-dimensional, there was no distance. It would be both dangerous and, 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 and kind of flat. <laughs> but, sorry. Um, so, I want to demonstrate that, this idea of parallax. I just explained that we do it automatically, but it's interesting to demonstrate it. And first, I'll do it by the diagrams here. If this baseline, and I'll use that term a lot, is the distance between your eyes, and you're looking at this object here, and there's a background up here, if you extend that line of sight up to that background, you'll be looking at the background that's up here. This eye, will be looking at this spot, but it'll be looking at a background up there. The extension of those two lines form an angle, and it's the same as this angle, and that's called a parallax angle. Parallax angle. And the word parallax comes from an old Greek word, which means change. Now, why would they call that parallax? What's changing here? Nothing's changing here. And in fact, if you were, had an object that was further away, then you see this angle gets smaller. So just from this diagram, you can get the feeling that 
that distance is related to the parallax angle. Now let's experiment. And this is what you guys can do. I'll get this star out of the way for now. Put your thumb up in front of your one eye and close the other eye. And line your thumb up with this dot. Okay? Now, without moving your thumb, close that eye and open the other eye. What happens? <laughs> that thumb, I don't know which, depends which eye you use, that thumb either moved over here or moved over there. From you, that's an angle. That's this angle. And that's just what I was trying to explain with this triangle. Your thumb's here. You close this eye, you looked up, and the background was over here. You close this eye, open this eye, the background was over there. But what happened, what it looks like is that this moved back and forth relative to the background. Now, I also want to show you that it is really uh, measuring a distance. You held it out as about two feet in front of you, full length, right? Now bring it in about this far and do the same thing. Oh, it's a bigger angle. That's what this is talking about. Thumb out here, thumb in here. So it really works. It really works. And it's just geometry. So, as I mentioned, distances are fundamental for our own life, but they're fundamental. They're one of the most fundamental properties that we need to know when we work in astronomy. Because we don't know the distances, we don't know sizes, for example. We don't know speed, we don't know velocities. There's all kinds of things. And I'm sorry, do we have water? I might need it. Oh. I will find out. See if you can get some. Yes, sir. So, um, <clears throat> imagine if I took a group of you folks up to Buffalo Park on a dark night and I divided the group into two, and we looked at the sky, and I want all the people in the group to imagine they don't know anything about astronomy, and they're back a thousand years ago where they don't know anything about measuring distances and the distance of the stars, and ask them what their conclusion is when they looked at the sky. And also imagine that if we were up there a whole night and things moved and stuff like that. One group might come back to me and say, we, the Earth is in the middle, and there's a sphere, a shell up there, and on that shell there's all different types of, all different brightnesses of stars on that one shell. And that shell is moving around on a nightly basis. And the other group might come and look up at the sky, and they say, no, no, it is a shell, and it's moving around, but that shell has thickness to it. And all the stars really are the same brightness, but some are farther away. Back in those days, and up until about 700 years ago, that was their understanding of astronomy. Now, they knew all the motions, and in fact, they knew much better than the average folks here because they lived by the moon, they lived by the star, they lived by the seasons that the constellations uh, indicated and so on. So they really knew about the motions of the stars, but they didn't know about the depth. So, so, What astronomers, there were several steps that happened over the last 700 years. The first one was Copernicus. Uh, for reasons I won't get into, he hypothesized that Earth wasn't in the center of this sphere. The sun was in the center of this sphere. And the Earth was going around. And the motion of the Earth going around the sun is the reason we had these different motions up in the sky. Uh, 
that was fundamental. But then a Galileo came along and Kepler came along. These are two uh, mathematicians and experimentalists in the 1500s. This was, uh, Copernicus was before Columbus came to the Americas and these others came after. And this was a big, uh, 50 to 100 years after, this was a big change. This is when modern science started. The conclusions that that group up at the Buffalo Park came to was the conclusions that all of the great thinkers had come to prior to the new science that developed. And that was called natural science. Natural philosophy it was called, actually. That's why a PhD mm -hmm. is doctor of philosophy. It's a holdover from that. Uh, what Copernicus began with, with the, oh, thank you, I hope that wasn't too much trouble. Not at all. What uh, Coper uh, Copernicus came up with, and then Kepler and Galileo, was that the, um, if you made an observation, and then you came up with a theory of, to explain that observation, you had to take the next step, and that is predict something based on that theory. And then if that didn't quite predict right, you go back and try to adjust your theory. That's what modern science is all about. Observe, predict, observe the prediction, correct until, and it's like a spiral. You start on the outside, and you keep doing this, observe, predict, observe, correct, observe, predict, and you spiral in until you get in the center where we have what we call a basic fact. And even in science, that basic fact can change as we get new instrumentation and, and better uh, equipment and smarter people. <laughs> uh, so the new science began then. And with that, the old, natural philosophy began to drift away. Here's another example of natural philosophy. Uh, Aristotle sat and looked and he said, you know, the earth is in the center of the universe and it's not moving. And the students would say, well, how do you know that? Because we don't have constant wind. If the earth was moving, <laughs> We have constant wind all the time. And that's the end of natural philosophy. There's the observation, there's the answer. And the difference is, I'll go back, science, there's the observation, here's the theory, predict. Then go and go and go again. So astronomers with Galileo, uh, I mean with Copernicus, began to think, well, if the Earth is going around the Sun, how far is the Earth away from the Sun? And then with Galileo actually observing the Moon and mountains on the Moon, and we knew it went around the Earth, obviously that was something we could observe. Uh, <clears throat> and then the planets moving in different directions and stuff like that. People began to wonder how far away it is. Well, parallax was something actually that the ancients understood. Because uh, when the Egyptians laid out uh, pyramids and other things, they used geometry and they used triangles just like that and they used angles just like that. And they could measure distances using parallax on the earth. Uh, however, with the new science coming in, the question was how far are these objects? that are now going around the sun. And so they use parallax. And parallaxes were used to measure for the first time the distance to the moon, the distance to Venus, the distance to Mars, the distance to the sun. They weren't precise, but they were very, very good. And we began to get a feeling of the dimension of our universe, or of our solar system. The universe is a long way to go yet. <laughs> so that was good for a while. But now we have very precise measurements. And one example is, I don't know if you've seen these wonderful little laser devices that measure distance. 
Um, and so what this does is it sends out a laser beam and there are two little lenses, I won't point it at you, two little lenses. One sends out the beam, the other receives a reflection from that beam. And by knowing the time it takes for that beam to get there and back again, it's 27 feet, four and three sixteenths inches. It's this, it's this distance. Radar does the same thing. Laser light, this light, radar, radio waves, they're all electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and I'm gonna shut this off so I don't shine it at somebody. Uh, and so, parallax gave us the first idea of dimensions. But now we have radar, and so we could send radar waves, electromagnetic waves to Venus, bounce it off the clouds, comes back again. We can determine its distance. Uh, when the astronauts uh, landed on the moon, they left a, a particular kind of mirror, which is called a cat's eye or a retroflecting mirror. And there's a telescope in uh, Fort Davis, Texas. Uh, and what that telescope does is it's, instead of getting light from a star and focusing it to a point, there's a laser at that point that shines through and goes back out to the moon, hits that retroflector, comes back to the telescope, and they record the time, which happens to be a little less than two seconds, and they can determine to a centimeter where the moon is, or at least where that mirror is on the moon. It's amazing. It's, a, it, it's truly amazing. And so, uh, and all the time, at least at night. So we have very accurate measurements of some of the objects in our solar system. I mentioned this Johannes Kepler, again in 1500s. He kept looking at the planets and kept looking at the planets. He was a mathematician and, and he now understood from Copernicus that these planets were going around the sun. And what he did by observation was conclude that the time it takes for a planet to go around the sun is directly related to the radius of that orbit around the sun. Demonstration two. Here we have a planet and here we have the distance between the earth, the earth and the sun, okay? The string also represents gravity. As I swing this around and try to make that a single plane, I have to go at a certain speed. So, so that string is gravity and it's pulling the earth into the sun, but the earth also has a speed that just wants to go out into space like that. The combination of it pulling into the sun and going off into space causes it to go around in this circle like this. It's two motions. Does that make sense? There's two motions going on. All right, now let's go out to Jupiter. Here we go. What's the difference? Speed. Huh? The time it takes to go around. And that's what Kepler, just mathematically and observing the time it took for a planet to get back to the same place, which is for the Earth one year, for other planets it's multiples of years, was related to how far it was away from the sun. Isn't that amazing? So by measuring uh, the distances to, let's say, the close objects like Mars and Venus and the sun and the moon, using that relationship between how long it takes to go around the sun and the distance from the sun, Kepler was able to predict how far all of the planets, at that time the visual planets, were from the sun. So we're beginning to get details in the dimensions of our system, our solar system. However, 
what kind of units we're going to use to measure that. If we use miles, it's pretty big numbers. There are other types of units, but I'm going to jump to the one unit that is, I think, the easiest to understand. And I'll explain it this way. If we had a flat road, just flat as anything, and a car that was automatically going 60 miles an hour constantly, all the time. Um, what does 60 miles an hour mean? It goes 60 miles in one hour, okay? If you had a stopwatch and you measured the time it took in one minute to go from this point to that point, remember it's going at a constant 60 miles an hour, how far would it have gone? It's 60 miles an hour, it was gone 60 miles in one hour, in one minute, and there's 60 minutes in an hour, it would have gone one mile. We could call that distance a car minute. <laughs> you know? You can use it just like that. It's a car minute. There's one constant in our universe, and it's the speed of light. And it's A hundred and eighty six thousand miles in one second. So instead of a sixty mile an hour car defining a car minute mile equal to one mile, a light second would be 186,000 miles. A light second would be 186,000 miles. So that gives us a great big unit that we can work with. And you look at the sun, and I told you we've already measured the sun, but because we used a baseline that was in miles, the distance was in miles, and that is 93 million miles. So if you divide 93 million miles into 180, uh, the other way around, 186 into 19 million, you come up with 8.3 minutes. So if we say we are 93 million miles from the sun, our average radius of our orbit, we can also say we are 8.3 light minutes from the sun. So that's a unit of measurement that really is very useful in astronomy. Inches and miles don't do it, <laughs> unless you want to add zeros that go all the way around the room. <laughs> so another thing to think about, though, is if there was some big catastrophe on the sun, we wouldn't know it for 8.3 minutes. But it doesn't do us any good because you wouldn't have 8.3 minutes to get ready because you wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyways, I guess the moral, as a, the, the corollary of that is just be precious those 8.3 <laughs> 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 Every 8.3 minutes is very important. So, <laughs> so we can then look at all of the other objects in, this, uh, in our solar system and turn it into from miles to light something. And it turns out that, uh, as I mentioned, the moon is uh, just a little less than two light seconds away. Uh, Mars is more like 12 light minutes. Pluto, you're starting to talk about four or five light hours. And just recently, we're learning that the size of our galaxy, of our solar system, is much larger than we thought because of these ice-type balls, which made Pluto a small planet instead of a major planet, uh, extend out to almost 24, 40 light hours, 40 light hours. So 40 light hours is 60 times, 60 seconds times 60 minutes, 
times 186,000. So you're, we're talking about a big number, a big number. Now, that's good for the solar system. What about the stars? This baseline is very critical. In fact, if we were uh, an alien and we had eyes that were out here, <laughs> we'd be able to see distances much better than we can because the baseline is so big. And here's what that means. If the baseline were this far out, and we're looking at this object. It's a much bigger angle. Okay? And if we wanted to look further and further out, we'd be able to do that because we'd be able to measure that angle. There's a certain point where the angle is too small and you can't measure it. So what did we do? We decided that Instead of using our eyes or instead of putting telescopes at either end of the United States, what we do is we take a picture of the sky when the Earth is on one side of its orbit and then take a picture of the sky when it's on the other side of the orbit and match it up. And all those stars that are nearby will have moved a little bit, apparently, just like our thumbs, relative to the most distant stars where the angle is too far to to, to, where the distance is too far for the angle to have any distance. So that means that we're talking about almost 180 million miles instead of our three inches. So you can imagine how much farther we can see. Now, uh, a second of arc, a second of arc, Bad circle, I mean, I ran out of ink. Uh, there's 360 degrees. There's 60 minutes in a degree. And there's 60 seconds in a minute. So multiplying all of these together, you get a big number. A second of arc in this diagram with the baseline of about 180 million miles, which is the radius of our orbit. Am I losing you guys? A little bit. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> what I'm doing. Who did this diameter? What I'm doing is I started with our eyes closed together and our thumb, we could relate to distances, okay? If I could move the eyes further apart, that distance that we could move our thumbs a lot farther because the angle would be bigger and you'd be able to measure that angle. It's, it's, all, it's all about either keeping the baseline the same and seeing how far you can see until that angle is too, too small to measure, or widening the base and doing the same thing, but that angle can be measured way up there now. Did that, that make sense? And so we went from three inches to say 3,000 miles to now 180 million miles. So think what a great distance we could measure that way. Well, I'll tell you what that distance is. If it were one second of arc, and that's what I was trying to mention here, that's a very small part of a circle. You could measure 3.3 .3 light years away. And we can measure down to milliseconds of arc. So the limit of the parallax measurements goes out to about 100 light years. 100 light years, how many do you have? Good. Uh, that encompasses thousands of stars, thousands of stars. So just by using a simple geometry, 
we can measure the distances to thousands of stars, but we're only out to 100 light years. And there's still more stars out there, and they're way out there. So we have to go to another technique. And this technique is really fun. This is something that I did a lot with. Um, in that sphere where there's thousands of stars, where we can actually measure the distances. We really measure the distances by parallax. It's geometry. We measure it just like our eyes and our brain do automatically in our everyday lives. Uh, so in that uh, radius of 100 light years, there are thousands of stars that we know exactly their distance. So what we do is we look at those stars, and since we know how far away they are, we know how bright they are, right? Take two flashlights. Be at one end of a football field, the flashlights are exactly the same brightness. Put one at the center, the 50 yard line, and the other at the 100 yard line. When you look at them, pitch dark, you can't see the people or anything, you just see the lights. One light is a lot fainter than the other one. We see that all the time. And that's another way that we measure distances from our just living. We've learned that, hey, those, those uh, car lights are way off because they're dim. And as it gets closer, they get brighter. So we do that all the time. But what we did over a period of 100 years is we knew these distances and just like those flashlights, we can work backwards because there is a relationship between distance and the, what we call the intrinsic, the real brightness of the object. The one at the other end of the football field has an apparent brightness that's fainter than the one at the 50 yard line. And the difference between those two are related to the distance. And I, I won't get too complicated. I just mentioned that, that the relationship is one over r squared, where r is the, is the distance. So if you have two lights and one looks half as dim as the other, it's four times as far away. It's the square, the distance. So we can do that with all these stars in here. It takes time, but we can do it. We look at the star. It apparently is this bright, but it really is intrinsically much brighter. And you, you should, you might have missed something there because I didn't, I mean, you might have had a question there because I didn't tell you one thing. <laughs> the color of the star, the color of the light from the star is related to its intrinsic brightness, okay? Another example. Okay. That's not very bright. And it's kind of pinkish, right? <clears throat> this is a little brighter, and I'll stretch it. It's more a little yellowish. It's not as pink. And I'll just go to the other extreme. Now it's very bright and it's white. What you're looking at is the intrinsic brightness of this object and its color. And they're related directly. So if I look at one of these stars at a certain distance, I get part of the information, but I don't know exactly how bright it is until I look at its color. And that's where a spectrograph comes in. It disperses the light, so you can see all the colors like a rainbow. And if I were to, if you were to look at this with a spectrograph, you'd see a, a, a light that goes from hardly any blue to a little bit more orange, and then down to hardly anything. And then if you looked at this one, you'd see the light really strong in the blue, and then gradually going down to hardly anything. So that color we can measure 
without even knowing the distance of the star. We can measure that color, and because of the relationship between brightness and color, we can put down the brightness of the star. Not just the brightness, but the intrinsic, I can't spell it. <laughs> One thing I didn't pass. Um, <laughs> so the real brightness of the star is related to the color. And now we know the distance. And so we calibrated a whole bunch of stars because we know the distance of brightness versus color. And it looks something like that, where the redder it gets, the less brightness is. The, uh, the bluer it gets, the hotter it is. So it's hot up here. It's cool down here. Now, what I'm trying to get to is how do we move out past 100 light years? You know, the, the parallax gets too small to measure, okay? Well, we calibrated this graph by looking at the stars here, where we knew the distance, we knew the brightness, and from that relationship, one over r squared, we know what the distance is. And we can check on it. So we can look at the parallax and say, OK, uh, this star is such and such. We go over here and say, it's this color. It's this brightness. Uh, according to the distance, it should be this apparent brightness. We look at it. It is that apparent brightness. So the whole thing works. So you've, you've, you've uh, checked using two different methods. But what this method allows you to do, that is the brightness and the intrinsic brightness allows you to do, is to go as far as you can see stars. So you can go now from 100 light years to the middle of our galaxy, the Milky Way, which is 25,000 light years away. So now we're measuring distances 25,000 light years away. We started with three inches, and now it's 25,000 light years away. And the diameter of our galaxy is close to 200,000 light years. Big, big, big. Remember, Earth is nine minutes, uh, eight minutes away from the sun, light minutes. Now, here's where it, Flagstaff comes in. So, we can look at stars in our galaxy, and we can actually look at stars in our nearest galaxy, which is the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest galaxy of the same size. There are some other smaller ones. And we can see stars in that galaxy. So now we not only can measure the distance to our own galaxy and the diameter, but to the uh, next biggest galaxy. In fact, let me... Uh, what I did is I made a table of distances and the equivalent in light seconds. So our nearest galaxy is 2.5 million light years away from us. So now we are measuring distances of 2.5 million light years away. That means the light from that galaxy left 2.5 million years ago when it reached, before it reached us. So again, the fundamental thing for astronomy is knowing distances, because then you can start talking about the size, you can start talking about brightnesses, you can start talking about all kinds of parameters that we need to know about stars and galaxies. So it's getting uh, <clears throat> pretty difficult. Well, let me go back. To, in, in the 20s, B.M. Slifer up at Lowell Observatory was looking at these various stars. He was measuring distance. He was using all of these techniques. But then there were some other objects out there that you, could, you couldn't see stars. They were just like smudges. Now jump ahead. They turned out to be galaxies so far away that you couldn't see the individual stars. Well, Beam Schleifer was very clever with instrumentation and using that Clark refractor and taking exposures in a spectrograph for over four days, 
That is, pointing at that object, exposing it, closing it during the daytime, picking it up the next night, he was able to get spectrograms of these fuzzy objects. Now I'll divert just a little bit. There's a term called the Doppler effect. <laughs> and so uh, sound is like a wave. It's, it's actually a physical wave. Uh, light is electromagnetic wave. And so it's, it's different <coughs> than a physical wave. And sound and light waves have similar characteristics. A train coming towards you, those waves are compressed. Those sound waves are compressed. That means a higher frequency. That means a higher note. A train passes you. The sound coming to you is stretched out. Lower frequency, lower notes. So that's why you get this <laughs> sound. All right. Light does the same thing. If an object is coming towards you, it compresses the wavelengths and it looks bluer. And if it's going away from you, it stretches out those wavelengths and it looks redder. And that's called the Doppler effect. So what Van Slyfo was looking at these objects and he's looking at the spectrum and they were shifted way to the red. And he said, but they're, that must mean they're going tremendous speeds. But each night they're in the same place. Have you ever seen an airplane go, you know, at the airport, it takes off or just buzzes the airport. It goes right by you like that. That same airplane, maybe 10 miles away, going at the same speed, seems to go so slow by you. Well, Dan Swiper said, these are going fantastic speeds but they don't seem to be moving. So they must be way, way, way out there. So this was discovered here was the cosmological redshift, but it wasn't called that at the time. But it did indicate that our universe is much bigger than our galaxy and the neighboring galaxies that we could see stars in. That was discovered right here. Uh, <clears throat> That was a major discussion for 20 or 30 years. In the meantime, relativity was being understood more and more. And what happened is that a combination of things happened that led to the understanding that our universe, wherever anybody looked with more powerful telescopes and looked at these smudges things, they seemed to be going farther, faster and faster away in all directions. And it turns out that that be was the uh, uh, galactic redshift and relativity combined with measurements like this to calibrate it indicated that if you can measure that redshift, and through calibration, it was equal to distance if there was this constant that you divided by it. And a lot of cosmology now is trying to define more accurately this constant because there are objects close enough that have a galactic redshift where we can measure the distances by other means. So you can put in this and put in that and the difference is this. And that constant is called the Hubble constant. <clears throat> and the Hubble constant really uh, governs whether our universe is an expanding universe or a contracting universe or a steady state universe. But I won't go into that. The point is, if you can measure this galactic redshift, and I think I'll call it galactic redshift because it's not the same kind of velocity that we think about in terms of uh, a car moving. It has to do with relativity, it has to do with curvature of the space and time. Anyways, the point is now we don't have to see the brightness of individual stars. It's way too far for parallax. But if we can measure that velocity and that shift, that redshift, 
then with this constant, we determine distances. And what kind of distances can we determine? Billions of light years, billions of light years. One of the things that is happening now with new telescopes and space telescopes is what is the farthest we can see, which means what is the faintest object we can see, which have the biggest redshift. And that's kind of what we're trying to do is look back into the beginning of our universe in a sense, in a sense. So we have gone from three inches <laughs> and miles to, uh, to 180 million mile baseline and 100 light years <coughs> to millions of light years using the brightness intrinsic versus to billions of light years using relativity and the galactic redshift that was discovered here at Lowell Observatory. So uh, I guess the moral that I draw, would draw here is we are infinitesimal <laughs> in this universe, okay? And the universe doesn't care anything about us. So what do we have? We have to care about us. <laughs> we have to care about our planet. I mean, that's one thing I think astronomers really, and astronauts really understand as well as anybody can, and that we are in this one little place, and we're only one group, and we don't take care of ourselves, Mars won't care, <laughs> Andromeda won't care, uh, billions of light years away won't care. So let's do it. That's a, that's 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 a moral. So I'd love to answer any questions if I can. <laughs> so why does light degrade over distance? What? Why does light degrade over distance? So why does it get dimmer? Over, I, mean, I, I figured it had to do with dust and stuff, but I apparently no. Well, there's two things. Uh, you, you're right. There is some problem with this. Suppose there's dust in the way then all our calculations are thrown off because the dust causes. But this is kind of easy to describe. Um, if I can imagine this is a cutaway of a sphere, and this is another sphere, and imagine that our eye is right here. I'll make it a big eye, though. That's an eye. <laughs> And it's looking out. <coughs> and that eye subtends an arc, you know. It, as the farther you get away, the more you see. So I'll draw that in terms of the lines going out like that. Okay. Suppose each of these spheres were shining at the same brightness. Okay. Then this eye here. That, uh, the light shining out from here, this arc would represent how much light that eye sees. When you get out here, it's a much bigger arc. So it doesn't see as much light. The sphere, the surface of the sphere is expanding. And your eye subtends less and less of that sphere even if that sphere is the same brightness. So distance changes, and it changes. I drew it in two, uh, two dimensions, but it's really, it's really um, a circle here that we're looking at. And the area of that circle is illuminated by the same amount of light. So if it's concentrated in a smaller circle, it's brighter. If it's concentrated in a larger circle, it's fainter. So that's the physical aspect. That's the one over R squared. But the other thing is, the other part of it is, yeah, if there's dust in between, then we did an experiment. We did an experiment. We were trying to determine exactly the uh, uh, number of photons coming from a star. Believe it. Photons are another way of looking at light. You can talk about it in waves, or you can talk about it in photons. Uh, and so what we did is we had a telescope out at Anderson Mesa, and we had this uh, melting point platinum source 
about three miles out on the mesa. And the reason that's important is at the certain melting point of platinum, we know exactly how many photons are leaving. Okay, so we took the telescope and we looked at it, and then we looked at the stars, and we knew the distance between the distance of the two, and that way we were able to calculate the photons coming from the star, and that's a very important thing for astronomy. But a couple times we weren't getting the right answer or the, the same answer because you repeat it over and over again. And we get to your question. It wasn't dust that was getting in the way, it was mosquitoes. <laughs> and at night, and it was summertime, the mosquitoes were attracted by the light source of the melted platinum, and they were all buzzing around, and, and so it was causing us to get less photons than we should have been getting. Uh, so uh, that's, you know, uh, oh, I won't, I'll stop and just I have some stories I can tell you about better than this. But never mind. <laughs> That was, a, that was a star that I studied in my graduate days. But anyways, another question. <laughs> you were listening, but it was hard, wasn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's the boundary of a galaxy? Um, uh, galaxies are held together by gravity. And they're concentrated in the center. Uh, stars are going around that center. Uh, we know now that the very dense center of our galaxy is a giant black hole. And the stars go around that, and the stars go around that, and the stars go around that. But as you get farther and farther out, there are fewer stars because there are great spaces <laughs> between galaxies. And so the end of the galaxy is not perfectly defined, but it's when you run out of stars that are circling that black hole. In our galaxy, we're about uh, two-thirds of the way out from the black hole. Uh, then there's nothing, and then uh, there'll be another group of uh, galaxies. A lot of, some of them are very small, or small relative to our galaxy. Uh, way bigger than a solar system, maybe a few different millions of stars. Uh, and then there'll be another galaxy. And we have a local group of galaxies, about 10 galaxies, which we are calling local group. And then there's great spaces before there are other groups of galaxies all around. But the definition of uh, the end of the galaxy is there aren't any more stars going around that center. And same with the solar system. The end of our solar system is where the gravitational pull of the sun is so weak that it doesn't capture anything more to go around it. Related to that is, what are the distance between stars, the average distance between a star? If you take an orange and say that's a star, and you put another orange in San Diego, and one down in Florida, that's the scale of the separation between stars in our vicinity. In other words, we shrink our sun down to the size of an orange and separate it by about 3,000 miles and you have another star shrunk down to an orange. That separation is about the average separation of the density of stars in our area. Now, there are other places in the galaxy where they're much closer. But that, that's just a fact for us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, Flagstaff, the next big galaxy. How far can we look out now? Light years. Billions. Billions. Billions of light years. Uh, it it kind of defines the edge of our universe, or the age of our universe, not necessarily the edge. Uh, our sun is what? What is it? All these numbers get jumbled in my head. I think we're six billion year old. No, we're second generation star. In other words, all of us, all of the material we're made out of and our solar system made out of was in another star that blew up. And then we floated around as little particles until by uh, just statistics, we started to swirl again, formed into another star and formed into a planetary system. And so this is the second time that's happened with the material we're made out of, incidentally. Uh, and so that's, I think, we're, we're 13 billion years, if I remember correctly. 
Uh, uh, yeah, it's four and a half. Google says four and a half billion for the sun. Four and a half billion for the sun's age. Okay, and so we're talking 13, 14, 15 billion years out there. And twice. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Eight years. Again, uh, what I was trying to do is combine the fact that there's vast distances that we deal with here in the in, in astronomy, but the way of measuring it is really Earth-based. You know, geometry, brightness, ooh. <laughs> and then a little bit of relativity uh, to measure it. Any other? Yes? A uh, little deeper, maybe. Um, the Hubble um, constant, um, I was just reading, starting to read an article in Scientific American about their. They're closing in, like it was anywhere from 100 kilometers per second to, to 50, and now they've got 75, but they just can't seem to <coughs> launch it down to a number. It's that's just, right. It's just a that's, range, range, I guess. Yep, that's that's the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the golden fleece of the cosmologist right now, is determining that H. Uh, and want to know what the H is happening. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we've had it, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you put a sticker in the next time? Oh. Right. Good. 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 Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for putting up with it. I, I know it's hard.